Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the final speaker today is Chris Avalon, who has been making video games since um, since I was able to actually understand that you could press the keys on a keyboard. Um, 1995? Yeah, 1995. He has worked on a quite uh, amazing range of video games that I deeply love and respect, including Fallout and Planescape Torment and uh, Neverwinter Nights 2. Um, and now he works at Obsidian, and then he did a whole bunch of really big Kickstarter things. That is correct. You've got it. You've got it nailed. Perfect. Okay. Um, give it up for Chris Avalon. Yeah. So for the talks today, you guys have gotten uh, a lot of good information on the components that make for good game development and make for a good gameplay experience. Uh, my goal with this presentation is to show you how you can finance your own experience. Because I'm sure among the audience here today, there's probably 300 great game ideas, but finding a job market out there that will support you in your game development career, that can be a little bit rougher. I know it's rough in the States. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the situation here is in the Netherlands, but if there's anything you can do to actually get crowdfunding support for the game idea you want to you want to do, that's my goal with this presentation today. Uh, so I'm Chris Avalon. I'm creative director at City Entertainment. Uh, I design computer games, and I had no idea there was any such career like that when I was in high school. My high school guidance counselor did not mention that as a career option when I was growing up. It made me very very sad but then very happy once I discovered that it actually was a viable career option. I've tried to structure the presentation today so that there's plenty of time at the end for you guys to ask me questions about the Kickstarter process. Uh, I figure that whatever questions you guys have uh, is bound to be a lot more relevant to your current situation than anything I can present in this presentation. So uh, I tried to leave a, lot, leave a lot of extra room for that. Also, originally I was scheduled to be in the morning, so I was worried this would cut into lunch, but it turns out that I'm actually in danger of cutting into your drinking time, so I'm going to try and hurry this up and make sure there's no problems there. Uh, I've worked on a whole bunch of titles uh, in the industry, a whole bunch of RPGs across a whole bunch of franchises. I was lead designer on Planescape Torment, uh, Knights of Republic 2, Alpha Protocol, uh, I was a narrative designer on Fallout New Vegas, and I headed up a lot of the DLC content for that same title. Our studio is now doing the South Park RPG, which is one of the craziest <laughs> role-playing franchises I think we've ever had a chance to work with. Uh, I never thought we'd be working on the South Park game. And I also have the good fortune to work with In Exile Entertainment on Wasteland 2. Uh, also be a part of Project Eternity, which I'm currently working full-time on. And then also a chance to be a part of In Exile's second Kickstarter project, Torment, Tides of Numenera. And all of those were made possible by the amazing power of Kickstarter, which I love very much. Uh, Wasteland 2 was able to get over $3 million in funding. Uh, Eternity got over four. And then Torment kind of blew it out of the water with $4.3 million. So, what I'd like to do today is showcase uh, some of the elements about each of these Kickstarter projects that I think that you guys could use for your own crowdsourcing efforts uh, if you want to create your own game and use Kickstarter as a funding model for it. Uh, I was also part of the Fallout Nuka Break web series, um, which uh, we just wrapped up filming this past weekend, so if I'm a little sunburned and my hair is a little bit crazy, uh, blame that web series. Uh, I was out in the sun running around a quarry for most of the time, and not everybody survived the shoot. But uh, I managed to make it here in one piece, so that's important. Um, to give you guys some perspective, uh, I am not a biz dev guy or a CEO of, of a company. Um, even though I'm one of the owners of Obsidian, I'm in charge of most of the design aspects for the company, not running the actual business development. So when I give you guys advice today, be aware that's where I'm coming from. I'm also not a marketing guy. Um, I think I've caused the PR folks and marketing people at various companies conniptions and sleepless nights various, based on things I've said in the past. Uh, I am not part of that world. What I am part of is being creative director of Obsidian means I have the chance to work with a lot of great designers at the company. Um, 
And our whole goal there is to make sure the player's having fun from a moment-to-moment -moment experience. Um, also, uh, people have stopped, people and my friends have stopped referring to me by name, and mostly they just keep calling me a human stretch goal because I seem to be involved in so many Kickstarter projects where like, hey, if we raise this amount of money, then Chris Avalon will come on board and help out with the Kickstarter project. So being a human stretch goal has been interesting, uh, and it's been very, uh, a very informative part of the process. Uh, but it's good because as far as Kickstarter is concerned, it's given me a chance to do even more work in the realm that I love, which is role-playing games. Uh, it gave me a chance to go back uh, to my roots with uh, Wasteland, which I played a lot in high school, uh, even though it made my mother very, very sad that I spent so much time playing video games. It worked out well in the end. And that's another reason that I love Kickstarter, is because it's given this opportunity to create a brand new spectrum of role-playing games and new games in general just by asking players what they want versus going through a publisher. It's given me a chance to actually uh, see adventure games being given new life. Um, I have a lot of love for adventure games that came out in the past, and there's been a certain lack of them over the past few years. Publishers don't feel that they're viable. All I know is that I want to see more adventure games. I'm willing to put forth the money beyond the actual cost of the product to make games like this happen. Go to Germany. Go to Germany? Yeah. I thought my only chance would be that Nintendo would be asked to play adventure games, but then Tim Schafer did his, did his, did his Kickstarter, and I was like, thank you, Tim. I just want to play your games for all time. Uh, it also gave me a chance to get back to the Torment world, which uh, I thought that would never come as another game in the industry, and Kickstarter provided that opportunity. But I wanted to run through some reasons about why I love, I love Kickstarter so much, and I'll try and go through this stuff very fast. First off, it gives uh, developers a chance to ask the gaming community what they want to support instead of asking one publisher what they think the gaming community wants. The ability to directly interface with players and then let them set their donation amounts for your game ideal, I think is fantastic. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to answer the players regardless, no matter what. So removing the publisher from the equation and sort of knocking out the middleman, I think is very important. If I don't want to develop for consoles, I don't have to. I don't have to worry about mobile platforms for a game if I don't want to. There's no lengthy contract negotiation, which can drag on for month after month after month. There's a lot more yes about the process than no. Uh, I have a chance to work with a lot of my friends just simply by asking them if they want to come on board and volunteer their services. And especially with Wasteland 2, there was very much a sense of bringing the band back together with all the people that used to work at Interplay and used to work on these original RPG products. It gave them a chance to sort of get back together and develop a new role-playing game in the Wasteland franchise. We're also with Kickstarter, we have a lot more freedom to share elements about the game with the community that we normally can't do with a publisher model. Um, for example, in Wasteland 2, we actually, I spent a lot of time with NXile helping them write the vision document for Wasteland 2. And then we were able to post it as one of our updates and allow people to look through it, see what the pillars for our game were. And this is something that a publisher would not normally allow a developer to do. If they would be considered too risky or they don't want to put the design elements out too early. But with Kickstarter, it's okay to share stuff like that. And if I want to share things like area designs or interesting area templates I did with the community and show how the area design process works, like how we break down skill sets and how players might navigate the environment in Wasteland, I'm absolutely free to share any of that stuff with you guys, which is very, very liberating from a developer perspective. Having that dialogue with the players, I think, is one of the things that makes Kickstarter so important. And the fact that you can have that dialogue early on in the process and get a sense for how your gang's being received, I think is extremely important. We're also able to do post-mortems of our game. This is also something that not all publishers want you to do. They would prefer that you not mention any mistakes that you've done with the title. I believe that players are a lot smarter than that, and they realize where you've messed up on various titles, and being able to have that discussion and have, and have sort of a free discussion about that, uh, I think is a, is a cool part of the Kickstarter process. But ultimately, being able to share your vision with the rest of the world, I think, builds morale with the team and also your target audience in supporting your product. If people want to spend more for physical goods, like actual tangible man manuals for the game, 
if they want certain developers to write like wasteland recipes for like Fallout games, if they want spiral bound manuals or cloth maps. Kickstarter allows players to donate more if they want physical goods like that. And again, with a publisher model, they can't always set up pipelines that deliver these kind of content to the player, except in certain very key like collector's edition items upon which like all those physical goods have to be set in stone. With Kickstarter, players can sort of mix and match and see what level of goods they actually want. So uh, between Wasteland 2, Project Eternity, and Torment, being able to do this process has been extremely gratifying. And if any of you have been backers for any of these three projects, uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Uh, it was both morale boosting at In Exile and Obsidian. And uh, being part of that Kickstarter process has been amazing. And it's been largely due to all the player support and player interaction we've been able to have over the course of these three projects. Uh, I'm a backer myself. Uh, I backed a Double Fine adventure, like I mentioned uh, just now. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other projects on Kickstarter that I've uh, put money into. Um, I've tried to make sure that what I can do is be able to give back to the community, not just uh, with developing products for them, but also supporting efforts that I think really stand out. And I'm really grateful to be a backer. But what I wanted to do today is give you guys some practical advice on how you can take your game ideas and use that uh, to sort of finance your own career and your own game development. Uh, the very first piece of advice I'd, I'd have is be absolutely clear on what type of game that you're trying to make. Uh, one common mistake that I see from a lot of indie developers is they have way too many pillars in their title. They're trying to do too many things with their game when in fact they should probably boil it down to two or three main elements and just focus on that. If you can't sum up your game in one tight, clear sentence about why it's cool, you might want to go back to the drawing board and see about focusing your vision so it's clear for the community what sort of game they're actually buying into with Kickstarter. Another piece of advice is you want to know your strengths and what you bring to the table. Um, whether you are a big figure in the development industry or whether uh, you are just out of college or in college, you want to be aware of what your strengths are, uh, how you communicate your track record of titles you've done, what sorts of games you enjoy. One thing that we discovered is when we try and bring big names in the Kickstarter process, the, the actual game development community has a lot of preconceptions about each of those developers. There are certain types of games or types of experiences they want from those developers, whether it's an Ultima game from Richard Garriott or you know, maybe a Gears of War style game from Cliffy B. All of, those, all of those big name figures carry a certain weight of expectations with them that if you don't meet, if you don't explain or meet those with the actual public when they're trying to support your Kickstarter, you may actually cause a disconnect with them that may cause certain funding damages. Um, they'll want to know what type of games you've worked on, and if you don't actually have a large track record of games to draw upon, then what you want to communicate to the public is what sorts of games you enjoy, and also what sort of games you are trying to emulate, if there's any similarities to bigger products out there. You also want to make sure with your Kickstarter that you're identifying the key people on your team and also what their track records are. You know, what's their editor experience? What do they bring to the table? Do they have portfolios online or in DeviantArt that people can look at to see what their style is? You want to make sure that's being clearly communicated on your Kickstarter page. Also, go beyond just your skill set. Uh, list your biography, mention what your education is. Let people know more about you rather than just uh, the actual game development skills you bring to the table. Uh, Kickstarter is very much about telling a human story. Uh, with your game project, not just the game itself. So the more you can show about your personality and the things that you're enthusiastic about, that can build some more support from the community. And all of that can serve to draw your target audience in. Um, target audiences can be drawn to either your game concept, um, certain philosophies beyond your game, not necessarily the game itself, and they can also be drawn to cults of personality. Uh, if you actually do have big name figures as part of your project, that usually does a lot to draw people to Kickstarter and donate. 
And we got lucky with Project Eternity because we had three figures associated with it between Tim Kaine from Fallout, uh, Josh Sawyer from Icewind Dale, and uh, me from Planescape Torment. But if you don't actually have a cult of personality figure to draw upon, figure out a way to bring them on board as part of your project. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, a number of people both in game development and even celebrities outside of game development, they have certain types of games they enjoy and they're willing to support. Uh, for example, with uh, the Dreamfall chapters that Ragnar Tarnquist is doing the Kickstarter for, he knew that Felicia Day, for example, like doing, like playing the Dreamfall game. So he reaches out to her and says, hey, you know what, uh, I would appreciate your support or giving me a shout out uh, on Twitter. Celebrities are willing to do that if you, if you ask, if you're willing to like, give them the demo of your title, explain the concept, and sort of give them a reason for why they should sort of call it out to the, to the, to the public. Also, there's ways to bring those big name figures into your project by doing things like, hey, would you be interested in writing a comic book for us? Would you be interested in doing a cameo on our web series? Approaching developers like that and giving them offers like that may have much more success than you might think at first, and it actually attracts more attention to your title. So don't be afraid to reach out to people and present options to them to see if you can get more, uh, get more publicity for your, for your Kickstarter. Um, I also encourage uh, going to forums that are similar to the games that you're trying to make and asking for their advice and asking them to weigh in on your project. Uh, one of the first things I ask anyone doing a board game Kickstarter to do, for example, is to go to boardgamegeeks.com and then present their idea to the forums there because that's their target audience. They are making a board game. Find out where that community gathers, present your idea, get feedback on it, iterate on it, and learn what they want from the game and what sort of things that they don't want. And there are forums for just about every type of game. So if you have a certain title that's, say, close to XCOM, if it's close to Fallout, there are plenty of communities that have been built up around those games. Find out where those communities are, start your own forum post, start your own topics, and start discussions there for what people would like to see in those games. Like, maybe XCOM Enemy Unknown was missing some really cool element that everyone in the forums is going on about. Maybe your game can deliver on it, and you can draw, you can draw that target audience to you. Um, but the actual Kickstarter push doesn't have to come from the game idea itself. Uh, for example, Wasteland 2, obviously it was a sequel to the very first Wasteland game, but there was more to the Kickstarter than that. Uh, as part of the message for Wasteland 2's Kickstarter, Brian Fargo was very much about presenting an exile situation with regards to, to the, the publisher model of developing games. He brought up all the facts in terms of here's how we get treated by publishers, here's how difficult it is to make a game, and basically presented his position in terms of, you know, we've been an underdog in the industry for such a long time, here's our chance to use Kickstarter to avoid sort of the pressures and the evils that publishers can bring along with the process. Here's our chance to make a game without any, without any sort of controls coming from outside. So, um, in terms of gathering your target audience, uh, having a message beyond the game, uh, I would argue that not uh, many people had played the actual first Wasteland game. So when Brian Fargo presented that uh, additional message of, hey, you know what, we are an underdog in the industry, we're trying to buck the publisher model and develop games on our own, that was one of the messages he had, but he also, was very clear about saying, I want Wasteland 2 to be the old school RPG that you remember. So the victories that he got out of this was he was broadcasting a much larger message about his Kickstarter rather than it just being a sequel to Wasteland 2. He was hitting people that wanted our old school RPGs and two, people that sympathize with the fact that, hey, we don't see many of these things anymore because publishers won't support them. So he ends up getting a much larger group than just Wasteland fans. And I think that's very, very important for any Kickstarter message. If you can find a higher message to send with your pitch, that's what you want to go for. Uh, also, In Exile and Fargo are really good about building up hype. 
and you want to do this as much as possible before you actually launch your Kickstarter. Uh, in exile was very good about you know uh, just about every few days, uh, almost an, over a four week period before they launched Wasteland 2 to say, hey, we got this original designer on board. Like we got we got Ken Saint Andre joining the team. We got Mike Stackpole joining the team. We got Mark Morgan to be a composer, and they would they would feed out these bits of information all the way up until the launch of the Kickstarter to make sure people that were aware that the team was getting assembled, generate buzz in the press. And that worked really well for letting people know that this project was about to get launched and why they should be excited about it. Um, with Project Eternity, we did something a little bit different. Uh, we tried to do uh, viral marketing in the sense that for anyone who visited our website at Obsidian, we put up these teaser images so that whenever they actually tried to get the site, there would be this moment where they could see one splash screen, a little bit of narrative text, and then a countdown, like four, three, two, one, up until the Kickstarter launched. And we, we tried to keep it very mysterious and have the public ask questions, uh, which worked pretty well. Um, but we probably should have focus, test, focus tested some elements of it, because when we actually started the countdown at number four, the big mistake there was everyone thought we were doing uh, the next installment of Dungeon Siege, which would make it Dungeon Siege 4. So that caused a little bit of confusion in the community, but still it generated discussion, it still generated questions, and attracted a lot of attention, so that was good. And ultimately, what you want to do with the, the hype process is you also want to give Kickstarter backers some warning that this Kickstarter is about to fire up. Like, a lot of backers aren't rich people. Like, they need to know when they need to save their money and what the, uh, the sort of time frame that this product's gonna be launched in. So, giving them some hype, giving them some warnings, they can actually save some dollars for a product they actually care about is also important, an important part of the process. You also want to build your own forum site. You want to create a place where your target audience can come and discuss your game, and you can actually discuss ideas, uh, everything from here's the rewards that we're gonna offer as part of our Kickstarter process, here's the different tiers we're thinking about offering, what do you guys think about that? Are there any physical goods that you as players feel strongly about? Uh, things anywhere from like, you know, t-shirts to how do you guys feel about cloth maps? You know, at what reward tier would you guys be comfortable for donating to get some of these physical goods? And also things like, as part of the reward tier discussion, not only do you want to feel out the public to see how they feel, like what sort of physical goods they want and at what level they're likely to pledge for those goods, you also want to set up your reward tier so you're doing early bird discounts. And what, what, what that process basically means is if you have a $25 tier that's offering a certain number of options, one good process to use is to create a very small subset of $20 tiers that offer exactly the same thing, but you have to move early in order to be able to get that discount. And all of those things can help drive the amount of donations you get on the first day, which is a pretty good sense of how strong your Kickstarter is on day one. So look for options like that when setting up your reward tiers with Kickstarter. Um, one cautionary tale is to be careful of how many physical goods and how many rewards you're giving to players. Uh, you do want to price these things out, and there's plenty of ways to figure out what the cost of these items are, either by talking to people who have run other Kickstarters, or actually by going out and finding vendors who do the cloth maps and the t-shirts. Get a sense for how much these physical goods cost, so you're not bankrupting your entire donation process just, just, just by actually creating the physical goods. And to make matters worse, one other thing you want to consider as well is if you're doing physical goods for your Kickstarter, you are getting donations from all over the world, which means international shipping is a bitch. Like, that, the amount of cost associated with shipping stuff around the world, posters, t-shirts, whatever, that can also bankrupt you as well. So make sure that when you're offering these things reward tiers, you're taking into account that if these people live overseas, it's an international donor, you are going to have to spend more to ship these goods to them. Another piece of advice I'd offer about Kickstarter is take advantage of the fact that the community is very cooperative. Um, there are plenty of other Kickstarters out there that are willing to provide advice, uh, post-mortems, they're willing to critique your Kickstarter pitch. 
Uh, Obsidian is certainly willing to do that. Uh, I, have, I have my contact information on the very last slide of this presentation. So if any of you are doing Kickstarters and you want advice on terms of how your video looks, how your pitch looks, I am always willing to volunteer my time to check those out. And I've certainly already done it for a lot of people in the industry. So if I can help you guys out, I will. There's plenty of ways that the, that the Kickstarter community can cooperate with each other. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be with uh, press contacts or helping you out with like vendor rates. Simply uh, being aware of other Kickstarters you want to support. As part of the update process with Kickstarters, we're like, hey, you know, every two or three days after our Kickstarter is launched, or every week or every two weeks, they have a chance to actually call out your Kickstarter to all the people that donated to their Kickstarter. And basically what you can do is you can leapfrog news attention and go, hey, you know what? Um, you know, uh, Project Eternity, once, it, once the Kickstarter got all wrapped up, once the Torment Kickstarter fired up, as part of our update process, we were able to call attention in Exiles Kickstarter and go, hey, you know what? If you guys enjoy old school RPGs, why don't you check out the Torment Kickstarter and see if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, it's something that doesn't, actually, doesn't cost any money. It costs a few lines of text uh, and a backer update. It's no big deal, and it's also a very cooperative way to show your support for, for Kickstarters throughout the industry. One other thing, uh, if at all possible, is not just to uh, give call-outs, but um, if you can actually afford to do so, backing other Kickstarters is, a, is, a, is another good way uh, to show cooperation and support in the community. If there are certain Kickstarter projects that your company or your project feels strongly about, do not be afraid to donate to them, to show your support. Uh, we're all in this together. And the fact that uh, if we can lend support to each other, either with press or call-outs or like updates, uh, if you want to give actual physical donations to other projects, that's also received very, very well, very, very well by the community. Um, in Exile and Obsidian um, have had a pretty good working relationship through Kickstarter. Uh, Brian Fargo is one of the first people that we talked to in terms of. Uh, hey, can we get a post-mortem on your Wasteland 2 process? Like, what sorts of things that you did that were so successful that we think we can use in Eternity? And we're able to share our, our Eternity successes with Brian's push on Torment. So all of it ends up being cooperative, and we end up helping each other out. And having that sense of community and Kickstarter uh, has been really gratifying in terms of the game development process. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice I have for running a Kickstarter is do not skimp on your Kickstarter video. That is perhaps the most important part of your presentation. If people feel that it's weak, that it's shoddy, uh, if, it, uh, if you don't have your best speakers in front of the camera discussing the project, discussing why they're passionate about it, your Kickstarter may suffer a lot of damage. Uh, a lot of people will not read the actual text for your Kickstarter. They will simply watch the video to make their verdict on it. So it's absolutely important that you do whatever you can to make that video exceptional. And there's a few things that uh, some seem to resonate pretty strongly with people. One is videos that show a lot of passion for what you're doing. Uh, that is very important for getting the players equally excited and recognizing that if they're backing this project they're going to see the strength that you're exhibiting in the video and the actual end product. Uh, whatever you can do to show gameplay footage and demonstrating actual core gameplay is a pretty resource intensive task and it's very, very hard for uh, new game projects to do that and I, rec I recognize that. But whatever you can do to either call similarities to certain types of gameplay they may have seen in other games, or if you can use concept art or cutscene images to demonstrate how gameplay will factor out, all of those things can help your, help your Kickstarter and give people a good sense for what sort of game that they're buying into. If you can, use humor. Uh, comedy goes over really well, but be sure to ask your friends first before you do it, because you may be one of those people that just simply is not very funny. And that's okay. Because if you're not funny, then just try and be sincere in your Kickstarter video. And sincerity for your project goes a long way. Um, like I mentioned before, with the Wasteland 2 project, uh, they were telling a message with their Kickstarter that went beyond the actual sequel to Wasteland. They were an underdog developer that was trying to buck the publisher model. 
and also they were trying to bring old school RPGs back to the marketplace. That was a story that they were telling beyond actually starting a Kickstarter, which is important because the press is pretty much bored with an, any new Kickstarter that fires up. If you're doing a new game on Kickstarter, it's just not news, unless you're bringing something more to the table beyond the actual game itself. So be aware that you're gonna to wanna to include some higher message of your Kickstarter if you wanna get traction beyond just a, a, a limited niche number of people. There's a few ways to get a sense for what this might be. Um, if any of you have friends in the press, uh, it's absolutely fine to talk to journalists, present your game idea, and ask them if there's anything that stands out about your project that they think is newsworthy, that they think Kotaku might pick up on, they think that Rock, Paper, Shotgun might pick up on, be actual, beyond the actual game concept itself. If the actual game concept, concept itself is strong enough, then that's great, but don't be, don't be afraid to pull the press people and get a sense for what they think your strengths are. Also do what you can to seek endorsements from other people in the industry. Um, there are a number of people that are willing to provide quotes, uh, tweets, Facebook posts that indicate the support for your project. If you can send them a press demo, if you can describe what sort of game you're trying to make, if you're able to highlight what makes your game stand out. Uh, there are certain things that I love to see from role-playing games. When I heard that NXI was doing Wasteland 2, uh, they had one of my endorsements right from day one before I even knew I was involved with the project. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for quotes from people in the industry. Uh, Rob Pardo from Blizzard, uh, he certainly has given a lot of endorsements to Kickstarter projects. And having those endorsements on your page just lends strength to your credibility and, gives a, and, and makes your entire Kickstarter presentation stronger. Every Kickstarter process should have an artist associated with it, because that artist has got a lot of work to do. The first thing they have to do is make sure that all the rewards that are being offered for the project are displayed visually, and that's an important concept. Not only do you have your video to worry about, but you need to provide concept art, you need to have visual layouts for how you're meeting your stretch goals, and you need to have visual representations of how, the, how all the reward tiers break down for your project it's much easier for players to get a sense of what they're getting for their money if they can just glance at an image rather than just reading a bunch of text. Uh, feel free to, to take your Kickstarter text, your fact page, whatever you're putting beneath your, beneath your Kickstarter video and send it out to as many editors and grammar Nazis as you can. Uh, it's very important from a professional standpoint to make sure you're using the right grammar and you're communicating a very professional tone with your Kickstarter. I've had to review a whole bunch of text for Kickstarter pages and given a lot of feedback on that. So again, if you guys do have Kickstarter projects, uh, if you'd like me to review them, I absolutely have absolutely no problem with that and I'd be happy to do so. But uh, making sure that you take the time to correctly edit your Kickstarter page, that's what breeds confidence in your project and it's really important. It's a little hard to get press attention, uh, although if you are communicating a higher message, if your game concept is solid, uh, if it's interesting, do what you can to contact certain press outlets and say, hey, you know what? On the very first minute that we fire up this Kickstarter, I am going to give you an exclusive interview and the right to publish that right on day one. And most journalists are very open to that because that gives them a lot of hits on their site. So try and work out whatever exclusive deals that you can with, with journalists to actually call out your project as soon as it launches. The more media attention you can get actually benefits both parties. Um, we were a little bit lucky on a Project Eternity because we had about five people in the office that could all juggle press interviews at the same time. And there were a lot of press that had questions about the game, that wanted to get specifications on it. Be aware that if you're starting your own Kickstarter, you may be the only one on your team that can handle the influx of interviews and discussions that are gonna happen. So be sure, if you can actually enlist uh, your artist, if you can enlist your producer, community manager, any other volunteer of support that you can get to actually help get interviews and press information out there, you'd be well, you'd be well served by actually structuring, structuring that as part of your project. We were fortunate to also be able to hire a PR agency. 
uh, for part of Eternity, and In Exile did the same thing when they were doing the Torment Kickstarter. And I realize that not everyone has the funds to do that, but that also does present the opportunity that if you, even if you don't know a lot of press people, you might be able to talk to a PR agent or someone more well-connected in the industry who does have a lot of journalism contacts who would be interested in your game. So look for ways to leverage that. If you don't have a lot of press contacts, someone out there does. It's just a matter of finding them, talking to them, and actually having them put you in contact with the right people to help promote your project. One thing that we found was helpful as part of the interview process was we always had one community folder where we dumped all our screenshots, source images, uh, any sort of the concept art related to the game so that anyone on the team, especially like the community manager or the producer, could have ready, have, have ready access to those assets for when the press people would ask for them for interviews. But ultimately, almost every journalist who did an interview on Project Eternity wanted some screenshot, wanted some piece of concept art. Having that all in one common location where they could draw upon it easily made the process much easier for everyone. Everyone knew where that approved folder was. They knew what artwork was okay to send out and they had easy access to it. Speaking of which, almost every Kickstarter project I've talked to the one person that they wish that they'd had is just having a community manager on full time. Managing backers and managing their questions and customer service is a big part of the Kickstarter process. And for the entire 30 days while you're running your Kickstarter, you will be inundated with all sorts of questions, uh, questions from anywhere from credit cards to information about the game. Having a community manager out there to field those questions and get back to people quickly will just help the process overall and will prevent the rest of the team from getting bogged down and ask, from answering the same questions over and over. Um, there's gonna be a lot of tasks to juggle and having the right producer to help you juggle those tasks if you can afford it or if you have someone willing to volunteer their time. Having someone to organize your entire communication strategy is definitely a huge plus for the Kickstarter process as well. The more you can interface with the backers and easily, that just helps the process. Because sometimes there's gonna be a lot of frustrations in terms of credit card information can get lost, people's emails can get screwed up. Uh, one, one particular problem we had, uh, I believe, with the Wasteland 2 Kickstarter was a lot of people had assigned an obsolete, obsolete email address to their PayPal account to prevent from getting various spam messages through, pan, through PayPal. So when we actually tried to contact them through their PayPal address, very few of them ever got the information. So it was up to the community manager and the producers at Exile to actually try and track down all that customer information and make sure they were getting the updates they needed for the project. Have your stretch goals ready. Uh, always anticipate that you're gonna hit your funding target much earlier than you realize and try and have two or three stretch goals ready to go right out the gate. Um, your very first update uh, with regards to once you hit your funding should be, hey, you know what, we appreciate the support, thank you for your funding, here is our next stretch goal and here is the amount of new content or new features that we can provide in this project provided we hit this new level. Uh, the actual stretch goals may end up actually costing you nothing. Uh, what they did for Nuka Break, uh, the web series, was they simply asked uh, Tim Kane and I if we'd be willing to do cameos in the web series. And since Tim and I had never done anything like that before, it was really exciting to us. And we're like, sure, no problem. We'd be happy to be part of your stretch goals for this. It doesn't cost Nuka Break a dime. Uh, it gets them more publicity for their Kickstarter. And Tim and I get the fun experience of actually, you know, working on a web series and actually being a part of the process, which was a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of PayPal, um, you want to make sure that on the very first day that you launch your Kickstarter that you have your PayPal process ready to go because not everybody can contribute through Kickstarter. Some, some regions of the world can only contribute to your project through PayPal. So you want to make sure that you have that good to go. Also, your Kickstarter will eventually come to an end and you can't do any more donations through Kickstarter, but if you have your PayPal account up on your own website, people can continue to pre-order your game uh, at a discounted rate if you have that PayPal service set up on your website. So that's a second reason that's important. 
because eventually you will be moving your project off of the Kickstarter site and onto your, onto your own forums. And that's where you're gonna to wanna to have that PayPal access. Um, your forums, once the Kickstarter page shut, shuts down, it's gonna be a place where you can have your dialogue with the players, discuss various concepts with them, get feedback on your updates. It's where you can post things like the bios of the team members. And it's where you can stress what the main goals of your project are. One of the best pieces of advice I got uh, about the Kickstarter process is keep repeating all the information that you can because you gotta make sure that it sinks in. Make sure that you're repeating what platform is available for, repeating the release date. The more you can drive it home with updates so it's clear to everyone who's backing your project, prevents the number of questions that you're gonna get to your community manager or just up, uh, up on random forums. Choosing your start time for your Kickstarter is very important. Uh, we usually try to do uh, 9 a.m. in the morning, but what you don't want to do is obviously start your Kickstarter at 5 a.m., for example, when most of the world is asleep, or if you're choosing a start time or your target country or target region of the world is either going to bed or is going to be in the middle of slumber when you actually start your Kickstarter. So choose your start time carefully to make sure you're maximizing people's awake time for that first 24-hour period. Also, the end time is important. Uh, you don't want to end a Kickstarter too late at night. Uh, both the Eternity Kickstarter and uh, the Torment Kickstarter tried to make sure they were, they were uh, tra tailing off the process about 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, on Pacific Standard Time. And that was a pretty good uh, time range for making sure that we hit most regions of the world as the project was wrapping up. A large part of the Kickstarter process is you have to do pretty frequent updates while the Kickstarter is going on. Our rule for this is to try and have a new update every two or three days. And those tend to accomplish a lot of different things. One is it helps clarify uh, certain elements of the design or gameplay that people have questions about. And there will be many questions in the forum that you'll want to address. It can also uh, cause closer scrutiny of stuff that you've brought up, brought up in past updates or that were on the Kickstarter page. It gives you an opportunity to discuss them at more length. And if the public isn't reacting very well to a certain feature that you're proposing, it also gives you the opportunity to, take, to give them an update saying, you know what, this feature isn't important to us either. We're fine with dropping it. We appreciate the feedback. But having those level of updates allows you to keep corresponding to the community and keep addressing, addressing feedback on a global level as it, as it occurs. Do what you can to encourage grassroots support. And there's a few uh, examples that, we, that occurred to us over the course of production. One was uh, we found one of our sort of, I hesitate to say fan sites, but one of the core RPG sites out there, RPG Codex, uh, was willing to start their very own fundraiser to like, you know, um, raise over $5,000 in order to have uh, their own adventuring company and Project Eternity. Once we realized they were doing that, we reached out to them and said, hey, for any, for any one of you that's willing to donate above a certain level, I'm more than happy to draw you custom troll avatars uh, for your posts on RPG Codex. And that was our way of saying thank you, showing support, and trying to encourage their donation process that they had already formed themselves and trying to get some more fuel to it. Also during Eternity, uh, we actually had a, we had a community come together and they called themselves uh, the Obsidian Order. And their whole theme was if for anyone who, who upped their pledge on Eternity by $8, they get their very own special avatar, custom avatar on the Obsidian pages. And this is all something that the community actually ended up forming themselves. And we were like, you know what? We appreciate your guys' support. What can we do to help you out? And they're like, well, you know, having some show of support from Obsidian would be good. So actually setting up those custom avatars for them and giving them shout outs and their updates, thanking them for forming this community. We did whatever we could to actually encourage that grassroots support coming from our players. One of the things is you want to make sure that you're showing your appreciation, too. Uh, these backers are spending uh, time, uh, money, and sometimes much more money beyond the actual cost of the product to help support your game development. So don't be shy about calling out people that are doing good work and promoting your game on the forums, if they're doing a good job answering questions for you. Uh, if, uh, 
for uh, any opportunity you can to actually show your appreciation and support for the community is an important thing that you want to do both with your updates and, and all parts of videos and picture process as well. Do what you can to give back to the community. There's a lot of Kickstarter successes out there um, and ones that could really use their support. So even if you, uh, if you have the funds to do so, supporting other projects uh, is, is welcome. Uh, showing that you give something back to the community uh, helps foster uh, a greater strength in Kickstarter itself. Uh, if you can't afford to donate to other projects, do what you can to give shout outs uh, in your updates. Uh, in tw on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever media outlets you have to call attention to other projects that you support, that's a way of doing it as well without actually donating any funds if you can't support it. Eventually your Kickstarter will come to an end and hopefully you've met your funding goal. The process is far from over at that point. Um, not only will you have game development to deal with at that point and actually constructing the game, but what you want to do is making sure that you're still keeping in contact with the community and still keeping your updates going. Uh, nothing is worse than successfully running a Kickstarter and then being silent for two weeks after the Kickstarter is over. You want to get back to the public as quickly as possible. You want to thank them for their support. You want to let them know what's coming next and making sure that you're keeping that sort of communication going. Um, with Eternity, we have updates that come out once every week ever since the Kickstarter got finished. It's a little, it's a little exhausting to do at time and, and requires a lot of time for people at the studio, but we feel it's important that we're keeping in touch with our fans and we're addressing design concerns or bringing up elements of prototyping, new pieces of artwork, uh, displaying screenshots. We want to make sure that we're keeping the public informed about what we're doing as part of the process. Your Kickstarter could fail. And the only thing I can say about that is use it as an opportunity. Uh, I've known a number of people whose Kickstarters the very first time out did not succeed. And what you want to do in that case is you want to do a post-mortem of your entire process. Were you asking for too much money? Uh, were there certain gameplay elements that people were confused about or they didn't support? Um, are there things about your project that you can point to that people had feedback on that maybe you can address if you started the Kickstarter over. And I've had a number of people that have actually um, stopped their Kickstarter, reevaluated where they were at, reduced their funding goal, dropped some features that people didn't seem to like, included various features that people liked, and actually had a successful Kickstarter after that point. So don't be afraid to hit the reset button and do another Kickstarter if you think there's things that you can learn from the first one that you did and have takeaways to bring to the next successful Kickstarter project. Uh, I'm going to go back to PayPal for a second. Um, even when donations stop through Kickstarter, leaving PayPal up on your home site is important simply because not everyone is going to have heard about your project during that 30-day period. However, if you're doing constant updates, if you're showing gameplay videos, there is a good chance that more people will become aware of your project and see more tangible things about it that they didn't realize the product was going to contain before. So for example, we recently did an update to Eternity where it showcased, here's how an environment looks in Eternity, here's some characters moving around through the environment, and on that very day that we released that screenshot, our PayPal donations spiked. And so what you want to do is use updates as an opportunity, indicate, hey, if you haven't heard of this game before or if you want to pre-order it before it comes out, this PayPal option is available on our site if you want to still donate. And we still get a good number of funds coming in through PayPal when we release updates like this because it actually shows that we're at more, much more stuff about the game than they may not have realized before or they may not even have heard about the game before until this, until this update came out. Anyway, so I hope that's some practical advice on how to run a Kickstarter. Uh, it certainly benefited us, uh, and it certainly benefited NXIL's approach to doing their Kickstarters. Uh, if you guys had any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. And... I'm sorry, I give you like no warning whatsoever. <laughs> Questions? Oh, I see questions.
Hi. Um, oh yeah, you talked about updating uh, frequently, like two or three days. Yeah, during during the Kickstarter process. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So do you update on the Kickstarter page? Yeah. Okay, because then it becomes maybe a lot. Because it does. Uh, the the advantages though are even though it can be a lot of updates. And ideally, you'd structure those so each member of the team would do one, so not one person is continually being exhausted by doing the updates. But um, we noticed that for every update that we did during Kickstarter, ever after every update, there would be an increase in donations, there would be a spike. So it's worthwhile for doing it for that. And second of all, you do only have like that, that limited time window to generate as much attention as possible. So doing updates that frequently, um, it just generates more press and more buzz. So it's to your benefit to do that. Hi, Chris. Uh, I saw in the beginning that you had a picture of Grim Fandango. Uh, do you want to see a sequel for Grim Fandango on Kickstarter? That is a good question, and it's both a yes-no answer. Uh, Yes, because I did enjoy the game so much, and also no, because I enjoyed the game so much. I think Grim Fandango for me is one of the best adventure games I ever played, and I think that was one of the first games where I realized that games could be art. And so I'd hate to disrupt that, but uh, I, I did love Grim Fandango very much, and I wanted to give a shout out to it. Uh, my question is not necessarily, uh, not at all actually, about crowdfunding, but more uh, dun, dun, dun. about your job description as a narrative designer. What would you give as a job description for that? Um, a narrative designer uh, ends up creating a story wrapper for the project, in the sense that once the core systems for a game are developed, uh, once you have a backdrop for the number of levels that those systems can play out in, then you examine what kind of story can I tell now that I know that those resources exist. And what I mean by that is, for example, Fallout New Vegas, part of the systems for that project were, hey, we're going to do a, a new reputation system for, the, for, for, for New Vegas in terms of have factions that fight with each other. Once you realize that reputation mechanic is going to be a core part of gameplay, then a narrative designer's job is to, well, how do I tell a story and how do I introduce story mechanics that help reinforce that reputation system. That means the narrative designer has to figure out, well, obviously you need multiple factions. Obviously you need those factions to respond to you in different ways. How do I set up an environment where that sort of process can take place? And then like with New Vegas, it ends up being like, well, we'll set up Caesar's Legion, we'll set up the NCR, we'll set up a house in Vegas. Uh, we'll, we'll, set, we'll, we'll try to make sure that they're, depending on the, on the reputation fluctuations, that causes story changes in the following manner. But a narrative designer's job is to see the game as a whole and see how the story can complement both the systems and the levels that you're designing. Thank you. We have time for one more question, so I'm really sorry um, for all the other people that have questions. Yes, hello. So it's important to uh, keep constant updates coming, uh, of course on art and music, but how do you handle story? Because are you, are you not af uh, afraid of uh, of supporting the, of supporting the audience? Yeah, uh, and the biggest question that comes up is, is exactly related to story. Uh, with Eternity, we've tried not to say what the core story is going to be. We, we've indicated themes we might explore, questions we might explore, very specific incidences that might occur, but the actual story content itself, we didn't want to spoil that for the main game or anyone playing. With Torment, they gave a little bit more information, the story and the layout, but that's not the sum entirety of the game. But we didn't want to, we, we didn't want to like release the entire plot script to the players before they have a chance to play the game because that would just ruin the experience. Good. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you.